and welcome everybody this morning. It's uh, February, first, or excuse me, it's March 1st, 2021. How quickly the time flies. Um, I call this meeting of the State Government Finance and Elections Committee to order and pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting is being held virtually. We had a little bit of technical difficulties this morning, but I think we've got them worked out. Um, with that, I will ask Mr. Brinks to take the roll. Thank you, Chair Nelson. I'm present. Nelson is present. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson's present. Carlson is present. Representative Natch. Natch present. Representative Bonner. Present. Bonner is present. Nash is present as well. Excuse me. Representative Joskowski. Present. Joskowski is present. Representative Elkins. Elkins present. Representative Elkins is present. Representative Greenman. Present. Greenman is present. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn present. Cleborn is present. Cleborn Representative Cosmic. Present. Cosmic is present. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason is present. Representative New Brindley. Present. New Brindley is present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Pulowski is present. Representative Quam. Present. Quam is present. With that chair, we have a quorum. We have a quorum is present. Um, first order of business is approval of the minutes from February 25th. Um, Representative Claiborne, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? Yes, Mr. Chair, and I move the February 25th minutes for adoption. Thank you. Uh, Rep Representative Claiborne has moved approval of the minutes from February 25th, 2022. All in favor, if you want to unmute and say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, the, the motions are approved. Uh, this morning, members, we have two bills and we have the final two candidates for the Campaign Finance Board. And we'll start out with the Campaign Finance Board and uh, Mr. Sigurdsson, if you want to introduce. If uh, the first one we have is, is, is uh, Margaret Lepping. Thank you, Chair Nelson, uh, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Jeff Sigurdsson. I'm the Executive Director of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. Um, this may seem a little bit deja vu. Both of these members of the board were before you last session for confirmation, but unfortunately, final confirmation was not uh, achieved within the 45 legislative days that's required by statute. So both members are again before you this, this uh, session for a confirmation hearing. The first member is Margaret Peggy Lepic. Uh, Ms. Lepic was first appointed to the board in 2015, and then it was reappointed in July of 2021 for a term that's ending in January of 2024. Ms. Lepic uh, fills position required for a former Republican legislator. Welcome to the committee, um, Ms. Lepic and Represent Representative Lepic and um, proceed with your testimony. You'll have to use your phone, Peggy. Um, we can't hear you again. This was the... Chair Nelson, perhaps we could do uh, uh, member Rashid while Ms. while uh, member Lepic gets her, her phone connected again. <laughs> that would be that would work. Um, why don't you introduce Mr. Fr Mr. Rashid? Uh, thank you, committee members. Uh, Ferris Rashid was initially appointed to the board in August of 2020. Uh, he was reappointed in July of 2021 for a term ending in January of 2023. Uh, Mr. Rashid is currently the chair of the board. That's a rotating position, a yearly position. And again, uh, Member Rashid is the current chair of the board. Uh, member Rashid is a uh, member who supports the DFL party. Uh, he has not been ever elected to a, a partisan office or other than precinct delegate ever been elected to anything that requires a partisan designation. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Rashid. You wanna give us a brief description of yourself. Thank you, Representative Nelson, and thank you to, to the committee for having me today. Um, as you heard, my name is Ferris Rashid. I'm a partner at the litigation boutique Green Eskel based out of Minneapolis. I primarily handle business litigation disputes, so uh, I have a focus in technology disputes, trade secrets matters, and uh, non-competition uh, non agreement disputes. Um, 
I joined the campaign finance board primarily out of or exclusively out of an interest to do some form of public service that wasn't capital P political, if that makes sense. I have no larger ambitions in the political world, but I am at a point in my career where I feel like I, uh, I've i been trained as a lawyer. I have a skill set that I can offer, and um, I, I found my role on the campaign finance board as a way to put those skills to use for uh, the state of Minnesota. And uh, in my couple of years on the board, I've really enjoyed the collegiality, the genuine debates and discussion that happen, and the sort of group effort to reach the right decision um, based on what the law says. And I, I hope to continue in that function going forward. So thank you for considering me. And I'm happy to entertain questions if you have any, or just be quiet. Um, member, we, any questions of Mr. Rashid? Uh, looks like you're getting, getting off early. I know we, had, we went through a lot of questions last year. So um, if no questions, I will move the appointment of Ferris Rashid to the Campaign Finance and Disclosure Board, or be recommended to be, you know, be recommended to be confirmed to the Campaign Finance Board. Uh, members, uh, Mr. Brinks, do you want to take the roll? Thank you, Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. He may be in transit right now. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Jaskowski. Aye. Jaskowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins votes aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. No. Kosnick votes nay. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. Representative Pulowski. New Brindley is no. New Brindley votes nay. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. Aye. Quam votes aye. Representative Nash. Chair, with a vote of 10 ayes and two nays, the motion prevails. The motion prevails. Mr. Rashid, you're on your way to the pulse floor. Um, Thank you very much. Representative Lepic, did you call back in? Were you able to call back in? Um, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? I can hear you great now. Okay, good, because I tried to call back in and they said the uh, number that I had used before was invalid. So now I think I've solved my problem. <laughs> Great. That, that, that'll make it make life easier. Um, we've already had, Jeff's already introduced you. So Ms. Lepic, why don't you go ahead and, and give your spiel? Okay. You've heard it before. I will give it again, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Margaret or Peggy Lepic, and I'm requesting your support for confirmation for uh, of my reappointment by Governor Walls to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. And I have to thank you very much for your flexibility in taking my testimony today. Um, I know you have my written testimony. Would you like me to read that, or would you prefer? That just I a brief, it? just a brief. Okay. Well, we 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 we've all read it, so just a brief, you know, overview. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I've been a very active volunteer for many years. The places that I have listed, you can see. Um, and my volunteer activities actually are what led me to run for the house in 1990, where I served for 12 years. Um, let me see, I'm gonna skip down here. I would like to continue my service on the campaign finance board because I really do believe strongly in the importance of the work it does. The agency is charged to oversee and publish information about money raised and spent to influence state elections is vital to the integrity of our elections and the public's trust in the decisions that are made in state government. I have a few thoughts on the board itself that I'd like to share with you. Because the Campaign Finance Board is a quasi-judicial agency, most important is the absolute necessity of fairness and consistency when dealing with individual cases regardless of one's political affiliation. I also like that the board has representation by the people who have actually run for state office and know what it's like to be directly affected by the campaign finance laws, which can be 
complicated and confusing. The board expects a great deal from both candidates and their treasurers, who are nearly always volunteers. And uh, so it has a responsibility to provide them with good training and readily available help when they need it. Much of this done, work is done by an excellent staff and people tell us that overall they do a very good job. It has been a great privilege to serve on the board. I hope that I have made a positive contribution and have lived up to my own expectations of bringing an unbiased, open-minded approach to each case that comes before the board. And I would be honored to continue my service there. Thank you very much and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Lepic. Any questions for former Representative Lepic? See no hands jumping up. If not, I'll, I'll move that the appointment of Margaret Peggy Lepic to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board be recommended to be confirmed. Um, Mr. Brinks, please take the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson, aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. Aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Jaskowski. Aye. Jaskowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins votes aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Friedman. Aye. Friedman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. No. Kosnick votes nay. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. No. New Brindley votes nay. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. No. Quam votes nay. With that chair, a vote of 10 ayes and three nays, the motion prevails. The motion prevails. Um, the recommendations onto the House floor. Thank you, Ms. Lepic. Thank you, Mr. Rashid, for your time. Thank you for everything you've you do on the board for us. Thank you. Thank you all. With that, members, the next uh, order of business is we have two bills and um, first bill. Um, Ms. Uh, Amanda, do we? I believe that uh, Steve, Representative Stevenson won't be here till nine thirty. Mr. Chair, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Fine. Uh, we'll start with Representative Stevenson then. Representative Stevenson, um, House File 3403. Um, I'll move that House File 3403 be recommended to pass and uh, sent, sent to the Commerce Committee. Representative Stevenson, uh, you want to present your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill, I think, is a, a common sense bill. You know, members will know that I am uh, a prosecutor when the legislature is not in session. I work as a prosecutor and that job is about accountability, but it's also uh, increasingly about uh, looking at what happens after the after the sentence, because, you know, almost everybody who goes through our criminal justice system is going to reenter society and we want to make sure they're reintegrated uh, and have the opportunity to be successful and, and not go back to criminal activity. Uh, and a lot of people who uh, return from the criminal justice system uh, look to enter fields that require a license of uh, some species. And as members know, there are many licenses that we offer as a state that are just not available to people with uh, criminal convictions and oftentimes for very good reasons. And this law does not, I want to be very clear, does not change any of the licensing requirements. It does not make anyone eligible for anything that they aren't currently eligible for. What it does do is create a pathway for people to understand if they're eligible for a license before they start going down the path of trying to obtain it. So what we're trying to avoid here is someone investing a lot of time and energy or and potentially money into attaining an education or experience they need to get a license only to find out at the end that they are not eligible. Uh, and so what we require is that agencies uh, uh, give a, uh, a determination on the front end as to whether a person is eligible based on their criminal history. And then that determination would be binding. So that's, that's the basic idea of the bill, to help people reintegrate, to help them not 
go down a path that's not open to them based on our law uh, and to streamline this across. I should say that mostly a lot of our licensing agencies do something like this, but we want to make it a similar process across all of the agencies so that people know exactly what they need to do. And Mr. Chair, I believe I have a testifier here who can kind of walk through the bill in detail. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, or Representative uh, um, Stephenson. Um, I've got Anna Odegaard, uh, Alex Reeves, and Corey Johnson. Are we talking Anna? Uh, Ms. Odegaard is the one that can uh, walk through the bill. I see her shaking her head. Welcome That's to right. the committee. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Odegaard, and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. And Thank you. Me. you did. Well, there I see. I'm looking at the wrong picture. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning. My name is Anna Odegaard, and I'm the director of the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition, which is a state coalition of 135 nonprofit organizations across the state uh, working to reduce barriers to economic mobility. I'm very pleased to be here this morning. We have been working in partnership uh, with the Justice Action Network, the Institute for Justice, and the Council of State Governments Justice Center to advance this legislation to create better transparency in the state licensure process. I wanna thank Chair Stevenson for taking the lead on this legislation and uh, Chair Nelson, of course, for hearing the bill, thank you. Um, and thanks also to the agency staff that we had many conversations with from the Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor and Industry, and the Health Licensing Boards who talked the idea through with us and helped vet our first bill drafts. They were extremely helpful. House file 3403 requires state agencies and licensing boards to offer a preliminary application process, as Chair Stevenson said, so that a person with a criminal conviction can ascertain prior to submitting a complete application for licensure, whether their criminal record would disqualify them from a particular license. There's currently no established process for individuals to request this determination, short of completing all the educational and training requirements required for licensure, passing any licensure exams that are required for that licensure, and then submitting the completed application for licensure. Although we know that state licensing agencies do attempt to help people on an informal basis discern whether their criminal record might be considered relevant, this bill would formalize that process so that individuals can get the information they need to decide whether to pursue that education or training requirement for licensure. The bill also allows agencies to charge a fee to offset the cost of processing the pre-application, and it requires agencies to issue a written response within 60 days of receiving that pre-application. The response needs to include a determination as to whether the person's criminal history disqualifies them from the license, and if it does, it needs to include the standards used in that determination and information about any additional action that person might take to seek reconsideration or to change the determination. Last, the bill requires state licensing agencies to report annually to the Department of Employment and Economic Development the number of individuals that submit pre-applications and how many are denied based on a criminal conviction and the number of individuals who submit regular applications and how many of those are found to be ineligible due to a criminal conviction. This straightforward process for people who have a criminal history to find out how their record impacts their eligibility for professional licensure benefits businesses who are always looking for qualified employees. It benefits workers and it benefits family stability and reduces recidivism. Thank you so much for considering this bill in your committee and for the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you, Ms. Odegaard. Um, the next person I have on my list, and Representative Nash, is that do you have a question? Can we wait, can we wait till all the testifiers? Or is this specifically? Yeah, I can wait. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, I've got Alex Reeves, and uh, Ms. I believe I heard her. That's uh, Ms. Reeves. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the test for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Alex Reeves. So at first glance, I probably just look like your typical mom of two. I work from home in the mental health field and I watch way too many true crime documentaries. What you wouldn't assume is that I have a criminal history and I actually spent two years in prison. Um, my ex-husband had a Ponzi scheme and out of two and a half years, I knew about it for six months. And by the laws of the federal government, that made me a co-conspirator because I wouldn't report him to law enforcement. At that time, I was getting my master's degree before I went to prison. I wanted to work with an inmate population dating all the way back to my undergraduate. 
I was pursuing a degree specifically in forensic psychology with a concentration in forensic assessment. Now that I have a criminal history, it's been a challenge even to continue my master's degree because school applications ask me about criminal convictions and even worse, I'm unsure if I would even qualify for a license even when I'm finished all, all the required education. I've emailed the state of Minnesota to know if I would be disqualified for getting a license because of my conviction and their answers are vague and really unclear. They told me I could be disqualified if my conviction is related to the specific license I apply for, but they didn't give me any criteria to whether or not my conviction would be considered or even related. The state told me if all else fails, I could submit for a special consideration for a license, but that would mean I would have to get the degree to be considered. Essentially, I was told I would have to run a marathon and not even know what the price is. This bill would make it possible for me to know ahead of time whether my conviction would disqualify me from my license before I spend the money, the time and the money to go back and finish my master's degree. I hope you will pass this bill because there are people with criminal histories who are put in very difficult situations and that are not their convictions and deserve a chance at their dream careers without the unnecessary barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reeves. And did I, say, did I pronounce that correctly, Reeves? Yep, that's correct. Thank you, Ms. Reeves. Um, the next person I have on my list is uh, Corey T. Johnson. Um, Ms. Johnson, um, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. And your, there you go. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Corey Johnson, and I am a senior policy analyst at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank Representative Stevenson for sponsoring this piece of legislation. Um, a little about CSG Justice Center, for those who do not know, uh, we are focused on bettering the criminal justice practices across the country in individual states. Um, as states focus on economic recovery, um, there has been a national momentum on fair chance life. Licensing. Um, as a member of the economic mobility team, we're particularly concerned with making sure that individuals have an opportunity to access meaningful employment. Um, states are currently across the country are adopting 13 best practices that ensure a past criminal record is not a permanent roadblock uh, to the one in four jobs in the U.S. that require an occupational license. Um, we have been offering states TA assistance in improving fair chance licensing to support economic growth, expand opportunity and maintain public safety uh, by increasing access to licensed occupations for qualified workers with criminal histories. Um, as a part of that project, as I stated earlier, um, we've identified 13 best practices. Um, currently, Minnesota lags behind um, most states in the country when it comes to adopting some of these best practices. House File 3403 would help remedy this by providing a level of transparency for individuals um, that are going through the licensure process. Um, here at CHD, we understand that authorizing pre-application eligibility determinations uh, for prospective applicants to know whether their criminal record is disqualifying before investing in the training and education required for a license is necessary. Currently, 20 states now authorize these determinations and allow qualified workers to pursue licensure without risk that a past conviction will ultimately result in denial. So it gets rid of that um, deterrent factor for workers that might be qualified. Um, and if anyone would like um, a list to those, um, as soon as we open a chat box, I can definitely send um, a link to all of the states um, that have implemented the pre-application process. Thank you for having me. And if you all have any questions, I'm definitely here. And Ms. Johnson, we don't have the chat box open um, for, for, for a couple of reasons, but if you can email that to Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Rudolph, she can then share it with the rest of the committee. Yes, sir, I absolutely can. And thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Nash, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. To the author or your first testifier, Ms. Odegaard, the other day I got a briefing on this bill and I'm largely supportive of it. I did have a question on a piece of language that was in the bill, Ms. Odegaard, that said uh, the fee that you would charge would be uh, not to exceed a certain amount. And I just wanted to know if you had addressed that issue for me because I, 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 it struck me as... Um, 
quite high, you'd said that it would be an average of a lower price. So I just hope that you had been able to address that for me. Ms. Odegaard. Mr. Chair, thank you. And Representative Nash, uh, we, I, we absolutely supported the suggestion that you made during that conversation that we uh, add some language to the bill, just capping the amount of the fee an agency can can charge at the at the moment, the language says the fee cannot exceed the actual cost of processing the application. Um, but to be honest, we this hearing came up rather quickly in Chair Nelson's committee. I had reached out to some of the agency staff we'd already talked to so that I could get a ballpark sense of what they thought might be a reasonable amount, um, but they really didn't have enough time um, to respond to that query before this hearing. I, I think it's likely the bill will be heard in a couple of other committees. I think it, it's being sent to commerce from here. Um, and we would love to work with you on an amendment if the author is amenable to that um, so that we can just put a ballpark number in there. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair, St Chair Stevenson. The author is amenable. And I, I think the bill is going to the Commerce Committee next. And I think that the chair of that committee is just going to be a real stickler on this issue. So uh, Representative Nash, you can have my, my commitment that we'll work on that between now and when it's heard in Commerce. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Chair Stevenson, I, I appreciate that. You know, for folks who are going to be re-entering, and you certainly want to be able to, to be helpful, but I, I harp on this regularly, the cost of government shouldn't be onerous. If there, if there is paperwork to be shuffled or processed or whatever, we should charge that amount and only that amount. And I want to make sure that we're, we're doing our level best to, uh, to, to do just that, particularly on something like this, where we're trying to encourage people to, to re-enter the the workforce and lo uh, lower the recidivism rate. And uh, I think that this is overall a good bill and uh, we can have some things to talk about as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, Representative Kosnick, you're gonna see you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the authors and, and advocates, uh, I believe there was a, a part of the bill that once the licensing departments uh, say that yes, uh, somebody would be eligible for a particular license, um, that that is kind of like guaranteed. What would happen or is there a time frame on that? Or what if there's a mistake made or there's another offense committed after that? Uh, can you discuss that a little bit? That's a little minor concern, but it would be a big issue down the road potentially. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Kosnick. Uh, I agree with you that it would be an issue if someone's criminal history uh, changed. And, and my understanding is that the sort of, uh, uh, you know, binding nature of the determination uh, is only binding if the person's criminal history doesn't change. So if someone gets a subsequent criminal conviction, uh, they aren't uh, promised anything uh, at that point. Uh, you know, in terms of an error, uh, I, I appreciate that that uh, is a, a concern. I would just note that it's no different than a, a concern if someone was applying under a normal license. Uh, and, and so we need to be careful about that. I think we have, um, speaking as someone who regularly uh, reviews uh, criminal histories in my day job, um, you know, we have good processes for, for sharing information between states and examining uh, criminal records. It's not to say that errors are never ever made, but uh, I think that we, we do have a good system for that. And I don't know if Ms. Odegaard has something to add to my answer. Ms. Odegaard, I see you, you're unmuted. You got a, you want to add to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Chair Stevenson. Uh, yeah, I, I, we did talk about this with uh, the agencies and we have language in the bill um, that does address it, just as Chair Stevenson um, just indicated. Um, there are three uh, criteria under which the determination would not be binding um, if there is an additional crime committed or conviction, if the original pre-application was incomplete, or if there was inaccurate information provided on the initial pre-application. Under those circumstances, the determination would not be binding. Representative Kosnick. Uh, thanks for the answer, and um, we'll have to trust the system, I guess, but um, I appreciate the intent of the bill, and I think it's an important tool uh, to reintegrate uh, people that made mistakes and provide little um, justice and forgiveness. Um, so uh, thanks for bringing the bill forward, and, and good luck. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. Representative Quam. Chair. I'm wondering where is the list of disqualifying convictions per licensure area? 
Representative Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Quam, it's not in the bill. Uh, that's an existing law in various places, depending upon the, the licensing board. I just want to take this opportunity to reiterate that there, there is no change in this bill uh, to what qualifies someone, or rather what disqualifies someone from a particular license. If a person is disqualified from holding a license from a, from a criminal, because of a criminal conviction under existing law, this bill does not change that. Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I heard the uh, first time the author stated that. Um, what is to prevent someone, just like a prosecutor, from ignoring uh, any disqualifying? They say, well, I don't think that should be disqualifying, so they just ignore it because we're seeing that with, with prosecutors now, just um, not, not prosecuting certain uh, things that they feel uh, ought not to be. So what is there to prevent a person from just ignoring uh, some list somewhere um, and, and saying, you know, I'm not going to disqualify you for that? Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Quam. Well, I think you're talking about prosecutorial discretion. And uh, I don't believe that our state licensing boards have uh, discretion in uh, under under law in terms in most cases, uh, at least I, I shouldn't say it so absolutely because I'm not familiar with every single licensing board. But if the law says that someone is disqualified under a certain license, uh, I'm not sure the board has has discretion on that. But in any event, Representative Quam, my real answer to you is this bill doesn't change the operation of our licensing boards with regard to qualification or disqualification. So the law as it exists now would be unchanged as to whether the, the board is going to disqualify someone or not based on a specific criminal conviction. Representative Quam. Why, thank you. Prosecutorial discretion is about specific cases instead of being broadly deciding not to enforce uh a area statute because they don't personally feel that anybody should be held to that statute and so there you know is a i guess disconnect in the interpretation there which i i think is um rising to a little bit more voice but if you're i understand the intent and, and i i am for the intent of the bill but i just uh if you're gonna change something, why not uh, clearly uh, try to avoid unintended consequences? And I think this, this bill is uh, not quite looking at what could happen, you know, when we make this law. And I just, um, there are reasons why there are disqualifying uh, convictions. Uh, whether it has to do with people are going to be with um, children or um, uh, prescribing medicine or uh, dispensing medicine. There, there are a lot of areas where there's really good reason. And I want to make sure that it's clear that you can't uh, how should we say, just say, well, I don't think that that should be lost. So I'm not going to, uh, you know, abide by that. And so I would hope the author would uh, try to help it avoid unintended consequences that could uh, affect uh, future victims. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Quam. I didn't hear a question there. That was more of a statement. Uh, Representative Raskowski, well, thank you for... Thank you, Mr. Chair. thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, thank you, Representative Stevenson, for your bill. Um, I like the spirit and the idea of the bill. I struggle with the fact that we have in here a fee and government is telling us that we will do this, which I think is very much the right thing, actually serving the people of our state, which I think the agency should be doing inherently. Um, but we actually have to have a bill to do it, unfortunately. But they're saying, well, we need money in order to do this. Um, what, uh, Representative Stevenson, what do we know about kind of the overall fiscal analysis of this scenario? We're going, we're going to kind of pre-qualify them or pre-application um, on the front end, which seems to me to be 
something that wouldn't take the, the agency very long to do, um, probably be very simple. Uh, but then we also avoid on the back end the disputes and uh, lawsuits that may arise um, if we don't do this. Um, it seems to me the agencies would probably save money with your bill and we should be just simply telling them to do this and do the right thing for the people of Minnesota. That's kind of my view of this thing. Um, I'd be interested in your response. Uh, Chair Stevenson. Well, Chair Nelson, Representative Draskowski, I appreciate a lot of what you said and, and I think this kind of goes back to what uh, Representative Nash was saying and, and I, I, I'll reiterate my commitment to try and address the fee issue before the next uh, committee stop. Uh, I think uh, I don't know if uh, uh, there's been a uh, the fiscal note has been returned on this bill. I don't know if the chair or um, Ms. Odegaard or someone else can eliminate that. I know that we requested one, so I, I can't speak specifically to the the uh, to that uh, on the call right now. What I would say to you, again, kind of knowing from my personal experience in my profession, is that um, uh, obtaining uh, criminal records from uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, can have a cost, uh, and uh, then uh, interpreting them uh, can take time. And of course, you know, state employees' time is not free to the state. Uh, so I, I, I can understand why uh, departments would indicate that the bill uh, would have a cost and why it might make sense um, uh, to recover that uh, um, with a, uh, a nominal fee. I agree with you and Representative Nash that it's important to keep that fee as low as possible. I think uh, one thing uh, to think about is whether it makes sense um, to have that fee be, be sort of uh, offset, to offset some of the fee that you were charged when you eventually apply for a license later on, because presumably there's less work to do uh, on the criminal application side when you actually apply for the license, if you've already had the determination done. You know, when you apply for a license, you generally have to pay a fee, but Maybe uh, it doesn't need to be as much if you've already had this uh, um, uh, earlier determination done. Uh, so I, I agree with the, the general uh, idea that both you and Representative Nash have indicated that we should really work to keep the fees down on this. And uh, you have my commitment that I will uh, do so between now and the, the next committee staff. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. I, I'm, I appreciate you uh, considering that. I, I just think generally as a legislature, what we do when bills come forward and have in the past is simply, okay, well, the agency says they need this kind of money in order to do this. Let's authorize that as a fee for them uh, in the bill. And I think we need to, and you have a great idea here, um, but I think we need to we need to tell the agencies they need to be doing this. This is customer service for the people of Minnesota. And you know, your idea of maybe offsetting the eventual um, license fee with the amount that they prepaid up front, I think that's a great idea, uh, might be the answer. Um, I, I can't vote for it with a fee in the bill. If you get rid of the fee in the bill, I'll, uh, I'll sign on as co-author and, and help you uh, move the shopping cart through the store. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Representative Skowski. And every, this, this discussion reminds me of a uh, um, former auditor, Nobles would always say when people would ask, can you do this? And he would always say, well, that means that there's so much I can do. Something, something else may, might not be able to get done if, we, if I do this. And, and I think that's part of, part of why when we provoke, propose new things for, or for, for agencies that we put a fee on it so that we make sure that they have the staff and the time and the ability to do this stuff. Um, Representative Stevenson, um, I don't see any further questions. If you want to wrap up, we can get to a vote. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I think this is a, a very good bill. I really appreciate the discussion that we've had today. I think it's been very constructive. And uh, as I indicated, we'll continue to work to improve the bill along the lines that we've discussed. So I'd ask for your vote today. With that, members, I will renew my motion that House file 3403 be referred to the Commerce Committee. Um, Mr. Brinks, you want to take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. Nash aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Dreskowski. No. Dreskowski votes nay.
Representative Elkins. Elkins votes aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick, aye. Kosnick votes aye. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. Aye. New Brindley votes aye. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. No. Quam votes nay. Chair Nelson, with a vote of 11 ayes and two nays, the motion prevails. The motion prevails. You're on your way. Uh, good luck with that, that nasty chair of commerce. Yeah, he's um, a real old bill. <laughs> With that, members, our next bill on the on the agenda today is House File 2996. Um, Representative Bang, welcome to the committee. Um, I'll move House File 2996 to be referred to the Agriculture Committee. Um, Rep uh, Representative Bang, um, present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, House File 2996 uh, seeks to assist Minnesota hemp industry by designating industrial hemp extract as an approved food additive subject to regulation by state and local law. Uh, this, le this legislation is an effort to provide Minnesota hemp producers and businesses some needed regulatory certainty regarding hemp derived food and beverage products, including those with CBD. It would also provide consumers with confidence that a made in Minnesota hemp product meets high regulatory standards, removing confusion in the marketplace and creating a more level playing field for Minnesota produced hemp products and related businesses. Uh, the bill instructs the Department of Agriculture to adopt rules regulating the production of hemp extract and food containing hemp extract, tolerance levels for additives, labeling and batch testing requirements. Uh, this legislation is similar in scope and purpose to a 2020 enactment in the state of Virginia. Uh, several states have enacted their own intrastate regulatory mechanism permitting hemp extracts in food and beverage applications. Florida, Virginia, New York, California, mostly uh, most recently Pennsylvania have taken this regulatory path to promote their in-state hemp businesses and products to much success. Minnesota can also do the same. Um, I have two testifiers who will speak about their experience in the hemp industry and this legislation. There are also um, a staff from NDA who can also help um, answer questions on rulemaking. Um, and there are also several support letters from interested parties in your packets. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield my time um, to my testifiers. Thank you, Representative Vang. And uh, the first testifier on my list is John Gugas. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, please introduce Hello. yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. That was a, a great pronunciation. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Um, my name is John Dugas and I am the founder of Superior Molecular, a licensed industrial hemp processor and extraction lab at White Bear Lake, Minnesota. I'm here today to lend my support for HF 2996 to authorize hemp extract for limited use in food and beverage applications as determined by the NDA through rulemaking. It became clear in recent months that while the product ingredient our company was selling was compliant with applicable Minnesota agricultural rules and 2018 Farm Bill intent, our beverage customers and partners could not use this product to manufacture a beverage or food item within the state of Minnesota. Subsequently, our customers received cease and desist letters from the department and their products were removed from shelves and these projects were put on pause. Our customers comp complied with the state's orders only to discover their CBD beverage had just been replaced by one from an out-of-state manufacturer, which may or may not receive any enforcement action. It is our belief that if anybody should have the pr privilege of exploring infused non-alcoholic beverages, it would be our tightly inspected and regulated craft beverage industry. The practical effect of current law surrounding CBD in Minnesota and Minnesota hemp businesses must stand on the sidelines while businesses in other states reap the rewards at their expense. If the state intends on ceding this economic activity to companies outside our borders and destroying the revenue channel for Minnesota hemp businesses, then it would surely keep moving in the direction and maintaining status quo. However, if the state's intentions are for Minnesotans to benefit from cultivation, production, and value-added nature of hemp businesses, then I implore you to seek reasons surrounding CBD and regulation in Minnesota. HF 2996 
is a step in the right direction to develop meaningful, reasonable regulations, which in turn will build consumer confidence in the safety and leg legitimacy of these products. I have confidence with the incoming Department of Agriculture HEC manufacturer inspections that the agriculture has spent the time and a thoughtful budget to inspect safely facilities like ours, given they have already laid out a comprehensive plan to do so. It is important for the department to develop thoughtful standards for this application by engaging with the industry through the rulemaking process, as other states have done. These products are widely available now to Minnesota consumers, whether it's a click away on the internet or at a local retailer. Unfortunately, current law prevents local Minnesota businesses from making these products. This proposed policy change and regulation will help our industry immensely. Thank you, Representative Bang, for your courage to tackle such an important issue for our industry. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Dugas. The next person I have on my list is Beecher Valencourt. I hope I speak and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Welcome uh, to yes, the committee. Yes. Yes, you did, and thank you very much. Um, so please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed. My name is Beecher Valencourt. I am a partner of Balance Naturals, a Minnesota-based female-founded wellness and cannabis company. Balance Naturals is one of six companies that fall under our global organic umbrella. We are vertically integrated and handle certified organic hemp extraction, processing, manufacturing, distribution, and have three consumer facing brands. We have 16 team members that work out of our Northeast Minneapolis facility. Our Balanced Naturals brand has three flavors of CBD infused sparkling waters on shelves in the United States. We found great success getting early to market and were able to land over 100 accounts in Minnesota and an additional 100 plus accounts nationwide. We created these CBD infused sparkling waters two years ago, initially using a food grade and licensed Minnesota manufacturer. That Minnesota manufacturer received a cease and desist letter from the Department of Ag, so we moved our manufacturing to the state of Michigan. Six months ago, our brand Balanced Naturals received a cease and desist letter as well from the Department of Ag. That stemmed from an anonymous tip. We were told that we could not sell or handle food or beverage that had CBD in it. To keep our business going, we licensed our brand and name to a Wisconsin entity that now handles sales, fulfillment, and operations. We are hoping this is temporary as it is not a cost-effective business model nor fair. To be a Minnesota company that is now manufactured in Michigan and stored and fulfilled in Wisconsin. I have watched dozens of out-of-state CBD food and beverage brands in the last year take our Minnesota shelf space and grocery, wellness, liquor store, and C-store. We have personally spent $20,000 in legal fees appealing our cease and desist over the last few months. We have also spent more than $50,000 in operating, manufacturing, and freight with non-Minnesota companies to keep our business going. Several states have made a pathway for CBD in food and beverage to be safely and legally made and sold to consumers. We are hoping for the same. We have been and still are more than willing to apply and comply with proper licensing, labeling, testing, and regulations once made available. The current laws and rules are hurting Minnesota-based companies while out-of-state businesses have free reign. Please help us pass 2996 so Minnesota can participate in the innovation and growth of this industry. Thank you for your time and thank you, Bang, for bringing this to the table. Thank you, Mr. Valencourt. Um, I have two people here that are here to answer questions if we have any, so I'll open it up for questions. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and to the test or to the author, um, I had an opportunity to tour what I understand is perhaps the largest hemp processor in the state resides in my district. It's called Hemp Acres. And I found when I was there um, a lot of roadblocks and hurdles that didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And one of the things that I was particularly struck by was that the utilization of the entire um, hemp kernel it provides great food items and other things uh, as a result of that. Um, what, what all will this bill clear hurdles for, for an organization like them that, uh, that will allow them to begin uh, 
seeking commerce within their own state. So I, I guess that would be to the author first. Representative Bang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Nash, you know, what this bill does is it will uh, give uh, businesses, hemp businesses, certainty that they can sell their um, hemp products to uh, consumers here in Minnesota. Um, that's the number one thing and also establishes um, NDA uh, to regulate these products as well. So it's also for consumer safety. Um, and so consumers know what they are buying um, uh, when uh, they're using these products. And Mr. Mr. Long, Representative Nash. Yeah, and maybe to the test fires, um, if they could address the same question that Representative Vang did for me, but also talk about what the potential commercial benefits would be if this bill were to pass on their behalf. Because obviously we, we want to do a, a, a bill that's helpful for business. And, you know, you many may remember that uh, I am a solid no on recreational marijuana, but this has nothing to do with that. And I, I hope that people do have the ability to make that, that differentiation. Uh, this is a, an impressive um, plant. Uh, it does a lot of different things. So if the, if the testifiers could talk about what it is from a commercial viability perspective, this could do from jobs and revenue and, and so on. Thank you. Mr. Valen Valencourt, um, you were saying that you were giving a cease and desist order. What was the thing, what, you know, what was the issue there that they said on the cease and desist? And I mean, what, how would this help your, as Representative Nash has asked, how would this help you to uh, expand your business or to actually grow your, or have a business in the state of Minnesota? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the cease and desist came from a uh, anonymous complaint and it is the Department of Agriculture's job to satisfy and fulfill any of those complaints. Um, during that process, um, there was an ask that we potentially become licensed. However, licensure is not available um, when utilizing uh, hemp extract in uh, food and beverage. Um, we believe that on the food and beverage side of things will be one of the larger um, uses for hemp extract across the board outside of uh, industrial. And um, to be able to have a clear pathway for us to um, earn as much shelf space in Minnesota with Minnesota brands um, would, would be great to have that assurance. Um, People love supporting local in Minnesota, and we have wonderful innovation and technology here. And so to see it replaced with out-of-state uh, products um, is uh, just very hurtful overall. Um, Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And perhaps I can just talk to Representative Vang offline about ways to nudge this along. I, I Again, I, I'm... I would love to be able to quantify what certain businesses might be able to do. Uh, this is a legal product and it's, it's uh, provides benefit for a, a good number of people. And I just, sometimes we have very archaic laws, much like the, the liquor laws that we suffer underneath here in the state of Minnesota that are very anti-commerce oriented. So uh, I guess last question for Representative Vang, um, is this moving in the other body as well? Uh, Representative Vang, I, we don't like to refer that other body, but that lower body of the legislature, but Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe there is a Senate companion that will be in introduced soon. Okay. Representative Nash. Uh, no, nothing further, thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the testifier, uh, you mentioned the cease and desist uh, letter. Can you just elaborate a little bit more about what the actual accusation or opposition to your business was? Mr. Valencourt. Yes, so the opposition was uh, technically by law, it is illegal to handle um, distribute um, and uh, have uh, food and beverage products infused with CBD or hemp extract. Um, a part of it was asking for licensure, um, which we had no problem complying with and attempting to get a license. However, 
licenses are not made available um, when you're trying to use them for hemp and uh, CBD. Um, all of our products are made in food grade facilities and um, under licensed businesses uh, that work here in Minnesota. Um, and so we just needed to, uh, my thought was obtain a handler's license uh, for that in order to distribute our own product. Um, being that we could not get the license and the law, the way they read it was that it's illegal to have CBD in food and beverage. Um, we had to, um, you know, move our business out of state. Okay. I appreciate it. I see Ms. Simon has her hand up. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then proceed. Ms. Simon. Uh, good morning. My name is Catherine Simon. I'm the director of the Food and Feed Safety Division for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So I, um, we're here to offer uh, any answers to questions. And I just wanted to um, clarify about the, the, current, um, the current status of, of the hemp industry hemp extract that's referenced in this bill. Um, so the, the reason why it's not an approved additive right now is that it has not gone through the food additive process. Um, so it hasn't had the full safety assessment to determine what would be a safe level for it to be included in a general food product. So there was a question previously about um, grain products. Grain products from hemp have gone through that process. They're now generally recognized as safe. There's three specific products that are approved for use in foods and those would be legal to sell. I um, just wanted to add that clear. Ms. Simon, is that is that the state process or is that a federal process? Ms. Simon. So currently, um, currently the state adopts the federal regulations for food additives. So it is the federal process uh, where they receive information from submitters uh, about the safety of products um, and that have gone through toxicology assessments and a variety of other things. And then the FDA specialty uh, experts review that information um, and either approve it and then list it as an approved additive, at which point then anybody would be able to use that ingredient um, or they seek clarifications or additional studies. Um, but yes, that is the process that we recognize because it's in our state statutes that we adopt that. So how is it that other states allow this and that we can then import those products from other states? I guess that's a question I have in my mind. Ms. Simon. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, um, at this point, none of those products that are in the state are approved for sale. So in the state of Minnesota, um, it is not allowed to have uh, hemp extract um, as an ingredient in a food or, beverage, uh, food or beverage product. None of those products are legal right now. So um, other states have gone through um, similar processes, the bill uh, introduced by Representative Bang here, where they have specifically allowed it for intrastate sales. Um, but again, those still have not gone through a safety assessment um, that we are aware of. So um, we've, we've consulted with a number of those states where uh, those products are uh, approved, um, but it's a specialty allowance right now um, that does not, is not tied to the food additive process that goes through the safety assessment. Um, but again, none of the products that are offered for sale uh, with a combination of food and hemp extract are approved um, within the state of Minnesota. So in effect, all those other products that are being sold that are elsewhere technically are illegal to be sold in this state. And so there are people violating the law currently by selling those products. So that's, what I, that's what I'm hearing from you. Yes, Representative, that is correct. Thank you, Ms. Simon. Um, Representative Mason. I, well, I will be voting for the bill because I think it's long past time that we recognize that, but the fact that there's still the testing going on on something that has been wanted by the public for such a long time, just, I guess I'm amazed at this point that it's not, we don't have the final answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Mason. Mr. DeGoss, you had your hand up and you took it down. Did you want to add something or? Did Ms. Simon, was Ms. Simon able to answer those questions? Um, I just wanted to touch on the, a little bit of, you know, back to Representative Nash's, uh, you know, questions about economic activity. I think for us as a wholesale, you know, ingredient supplier, uh, you know, guys like Beecher become customers for our business. Um, and we think it makes a lot of sense that agriculture has outlined a pretty elaborate framework for inspecting processing facilities such as ours. Um, so we believe that there is a lot of framework already in place that would make this a rather, uh, 
short jump to, you know, regulate this rather than allowing, uh, you know, expansive CBD use that is going unregulated throughout the state. Thank you, Mr. DeGas. Representative Elkins, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am yeah, starting to develop um, a peripheral neuropathy on the, the balls of my feet. So as is my usual habit, I immediately scoured the medical literature to see, uh, uh, you know, find out what, what kinds of, uh, of treatments might be available, things that I could do to uh, arrest the spread. And uh, in the course of that research, uh, I stumbled across uh, papers that uh, described uh, you know, CBD as a potential uh, uh, you know, cure or at least treatment for a wide variety of neurological uh, disorders, including peripheral neuropathy, Parkinson's disease, uh, other you know, uh, disturbances of the, uh, of the nervous system. And as you know, other, others have noted, uh, the substance is completely um, legal, widely uh, available, uh, and uh, the research is continuing into the uh, you know, potential benefits of, of using CBD for many of these kinds of conditions. There isn't anything in the medical literature indicating that, that CBD is in any way harmful. Uh, uh, so you know, any, anything that we can do, I think that, uh, make this legal and uh, um, potentially um, therapeutic substance more available, I think we should be supporting. Uh, it's more of a statement I heard there, no question. Representative Quam, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, when I went to school, um, we weren't uh, concerned about or we didn't really know about allergies, but I noticed, and food allergy, a lot of food allergies. But I noticed now in schools, there is a great deal of uh, uh, activity to prevent, uh, you know, food allergies. Uh, peanut allergies are, are a big one, but there are a lot of different allergies out there. Um, and I like the intent of the bill, but it sounds like the, the author doesn't have knowledge and this, the state expert doesn't have knowledge of testing to confirm that there aren't any um, allergies or other safety issues out there. And a lot of this comes through the fact that uh, a federal illegal um, you know, substance or family of substances are being allowed inside of individual states. And so maybe the author can uh, tell us if there are any states that have done any, uh, any testing um, similar to what the FDA has done or does do uh, before something is, is legal to, uh, to sell and disperse. And if there are any states that have uh, warning or disclaimers on it, um, such as almost any food now we get, there's if there's a chance that there could be, uh, you know, nut or peanut um, contamination or other uh, contamination, I just like to know, um, you know, is there anything out there like that, and has there been any testing by any state to verify that there isn't anything out there like that? Thank you, Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, regard regard to testing, uh, this bill will allow MDA or authorize the MDA to, to look into batch testing regulation. Uh, for a long time, since 2018, when the Farm Bill legalized hemp, um, the FDA has not really given clarity. As much as um, our MDA wants to um, get clarity from FDA, they've been silent uh, to this, to, and to even now. And meanwhile, um, other states have chosen to regulate on their own. Um, uh, to because there is a market, cons there is consumer demand, there are these products, and therefore states are choosing to regulate on their own, um, despite silence from FDA. Um, and, you know, I, I, I believe MDA could probably be more specific on what types of testing, how they will look into um, um, research on, on uh, looking at the tolerance level for food additives, um, that sort of thing. 
And I see Ms. Simon has her hand back up. Ms. Simon. Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, to uh, support the comments that Representative Hedman has mentioned as well, um, I'll just clarify. Um, for this bill, it's about it's specifically to adding it as a food additive, which would be um, allowed for general use in food, coupled with uh, the rulemaking that has been included in here. Um, but I did want to clarify that um, these uh, industrial hemp extract products are currently legal through a Board of Pharmacy regulation right now. Um, it's specifically the addition of that product in combination with food and then selling it as a food product um, that is, is currently not allowed um, because of it has not gone through that full food safety assessment through the food additive process. So just, just to clarify that those products, um, there are products that would be uh, legal in Minnesota in case that was not clear from my previous statement. Um, and uh, also to support with those comments that we, we are hearing clearly um, both from the industry members here as well as constituents that there's a strong desire for these products. Um, I think where we uh, want to continue to work with um, a variety of advocates and stakeholders at this point is on the intended use of those products. So what was specifically referenced here was um, a mention of therapeutic uses. Um, that is overwhelmingly the, the need that has that we are hearing from stakeholders, the desire to use it in, in um, as a therapeutic product. Um, and so that's why we do want to clarify that um, there is an allowance in, in a board pharmacy regulation for these types of products to be sold. Um, and we're interested in continuing to work to address the, the comments that Representative Vang had said as well, that um, currently there are some statements from FDA about um, some safety concerns with the product. Um, but recognizing that the full safety assessment as to uh, the, the complete impact of those and what the guidance would be is, is not clear right now. But um, there have been adverse impact reports. Um, there have been CDC notices as well as some other statements from FDA specific to human health hazard where it's, um, this product does have those therapeutic intentions. It does have an impact on the body. Um, and they are uh, recommending that it be uh, uh, kept away from children because there have been uh, reports of children going into the hospital after um, gaining access to similar types of products. So um, recognizing again that there's a, an industry need to be able to move forward, um, but uh, we're really, really uh, interested in working with how we can make sure that that's done in a way where the consumers are kept safe um, and the industry is also supported so that it can be, um, it can have a, a, a good long uh, career um, and we've got a good regulatory structure. Um, so with that uh, as well, the other information we're getting from states is that um, most of the states who do currently have the allowance for these types of products, um, no matter how it initiated, whether it was in food or it was in smaller specialty categories, they are looking towards um, more centralized control um, in an office of cannabis um, types of uh, arrangements. They're really looking for um, a board that has the specialty to be able to um, oversee these types of products uh, based on their um, laboratory uses, therapeutic uses, and some of the other safeguards that would be similar for consumers who are taking those types of products. Thank you, Ms. Simon. Mr. Dugas, I see you've got your hand up. Do you want to add to the discussion? Yes, I, I think one thing I want to recognize is that the concern that we have as a company is that there's large milligram dosage uh, products widely available in the state of Minnesota, you know, in the upwards of one, two, three, four thousand milligram, um, you know, bottles of CBD. And I think what's concerning to us is that the most of the edible food and beverage products are about 10 to 25 milligrams only per serving size. And so I guess our concern is that is the issue is that it, 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 it is a food and beverage, but the, the dose and serving size, you know, pales in comparison to what's widely available currently. Um, and I would argue that CBD is probably the only ingredient used in our emulsification process that, you know, is subject to the FDA ruling. Everything else we use is a common, you know, food or beverage ingredient already. Thank you, Mr. Dugas. Representative Kwam, did, did that answer, to answer your question? Representative Kwam. Um, it, it, it had some clarifications, but so um, is this just CBD or are there other components that might be there, um, and if there are any required disclaimers on medication or restrictions of, uh, you know, it seems as if there were concerns about uh, children, um, what kind of dis disclaimers would be required on the packaging for any of the food that would contain uh, this? I'm trying to get more clarity that and the author indicated, well, we'll be doing some testing 
and this will help us uh, do tests. Uh, generally, that for the safety of our citizens, we do the testing before we we uh, you know legalize something that hasn't gone through federal legalization for uh, for use in, in in foods. So, uh, what kind of disclaimers would be involved with with uh, these products if the author could clarify? Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this is what this bill will, will authorize India to do is to look at the labeling requirements um, uh, after, you know, uh, this is what the rulemaking authority does. And so I guess I will defer this to um, Ms. Simon. Ms. Simon. Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, yes, I, I believe based on, on my understanding of the bill that the intent is that that would be included in the rulemaking that referenced. Thank you, Ms. Simon. Representative Kwam. So um, nothing will be sold or legal in the state of Minnesota until the rulemaking, the disclaimers, and all the other stuff are, are, are done. What kind of guarantee? Yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? We're sort of what comes first and not. Um, I know there's a, a, a great desire to make this uh, available, and I understand that uh, um, you know there isn't. But um, I'm I'm torn with the responsibility that we make sure that everything's been checked and verified before we go ahead and say we can have this as a food additive. Um, and I don't want to discover uh, six months down the line that uh, kindergartners. Um, a certain percentage have a reaction, or you understand where I'm going, Mr. Chair, and, and I, I'd like for clarity to, to be more assured, but I just uh, right now have, have questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Kwam. As I see looking at the language of the bill, it's, that's what this is about. It's about instructing the Department of, I believe the Department of Ag to do rules and do that do that and come up those rules of how that how it can legally be sold um so representative claiborne now you get the last question then we're going to get to move to a vote on this representative claiborne thank you and mr chair you just started what i was going to say it's in my reading of the bill what we're doing is allowing the department of agriculture to um clarify what foods it would be contained in, what tolerance level could be allowed, what batch testing requirements are, and other labeling. It's Labeling uh, requirements, yep. yep, some... yep. I just wanna make sure that we're all clear on what we're discussing. Thank you. Um, I, and that's what the bill does, That uh, the language of the bill does. Um, Representative Vang, um, you can wrap up and then we'll get to a vote. Representative Vang. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for the discussion. Uh, this is a good bill both for consumer safety and also for uh, the Minnesota hemp industry. Um, you know, it is a growing industry ever since we legalized it in 2018 and uh, this will be a good bill for us to support. Thank you. And with that members, I'll renew my motion that House File 2996 be referred to the Agricultural the Agriculture Committee. Uh, Mr. Brinks, do you wanna take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. Aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Representative Draskowski. Aye. Draskowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins votes aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleveland. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick votes aye. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley. Aye. New Brindley votes aye. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski votes aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. Abstain. Quam abstains. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Chair Nelson, with a vote of 12 ayes and one abstain, the motion prevails. 
The motion prevails. The bill is on its way to the Agriculture Committee. Thank you, Representative Vang, and good luck on, on, on your path. The FAB members, um, that finishes our, our agenda for today. We got a meeting this Thursday. Um, we have three bills currently on the, on the agenda, um, House File 726, 2026, and 2847. And so members, with that, um, we are adjourned for today. Thank you all. <laughs>